Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Dick van Oeveren and in this video I will take you to the wondrous world of MPLS. So this is a first of a series of videos where I'll be showing you how to configure the many different MPLS features. The goal of these series is to show you how to configure MPLS functionality on Conware based devices. The videos will not cover in-depth MPLS theory and how MPLS exactly works. You can find some very good reference documentation on the internet and a very good start is the MPLS configuration guides of the Conway devices. These guides contain very explanatory information on how MPLS exactly works. In this video I will start with the foundation of MPLS. Namely MPLS relies on an underlay which is IP routing. So what we have to do in order to establish an MPLS connection between two endpoints is that we have to make sure that both endpoints can reach each other. A typical way of achieving this for MPLS is to use an interior gateway protocol like OSPF. You can also use ISES for this, but this is less common. In the diagram you can see what we want to achieve. So we have created a setup with two provider edge routers and two provider routers. The PE routers are the edge routers terminating the MPLS connection, whereas the PE routers provide the MPLS label forwarding. Now in order for the PE devices to be able to establish the MPLS connectivity, the PE devices should be able to communicate with each other, as said. So what I will show you is how to achieve this with OSPF. I have already configured IP addresses on all the interfaces, so, so let me show you uh, what's on the interfaces. So if I do display IP interface brief, you can see that the interfaces are configured here as described in the diagram I just showed you. Um, the same here. And let me just take this one as well. And so the goal is for PE2 to be able to reach PE1. So what you can see now is I have two IP addresses, uh, one on PE1, which is 172.16.1.1, and the other one is on PE2, which is 172.16.2.1. And let me see if I can ping. I should not be able to ping uh, the other side because there's no routing setup. .2.1, and then this should go to 1.1 can see that's not working so uh, so let's uh, let's start uh, and setting up OSPF here I've also configured a loopback interface on all the devices because it's best practice to use a loopback interface as termination point for the MPLS connections typically and also for routing processes like OSPF if you use an IP address of a physical interface and that physical interface becomes unavailable for any reason, this would mean that all MPLS and routing processes are disrupted. With a loop back interface, you don't have that situation. The first step is to assign a router ID to all the devices. The router ID is used to distinguish the routers so that each router in an OSPF routed network can be identified for various OSPF operations. So let's do this on all the devices. P1, P2, and PE2. Next step is to configure the OSPF area and assign networks to that area so that the device will propagate their routing information onto those networks. In the network setup we will use a single OSPF area, so that will be the backbone area. In larger networks you may want to split up the OSPF network into multiple areas, but in these video series we'll keep it uh, in a single area. So let's create the OSPF process and the area and assign the networks. see that it's using inverse uh, net network masks and finally assign the edge network 
which is a class C network. Okay, let's go to the bottom one, bottom PE. So this would be 12. And finally, the CE network. Okay, let's go to P1. That will be the network connecting the two P devices together. Oops. Three. And then also the loopback interface. Zero dot zero dot three. Now, once all of this is configured, we should now be able to reach all the interfaces. Uh, let me first show you uh, some OSPF related stuff. So let me see whether uh, the OSPF peering has been established. So you can see here on the PE, the peering is established. And let's do the same on the P devices. Everything is established here. Okay, so that's good. And now let's do a show the routing table. And you can see here that uh, all the networks are reachable. So for example, I should be able to ping from the CE interface to the CE inter interface of PE2, which works fine. Now that we have set up the IGP and all interfaces, uh, IP interfaces are reachable, let's start with a very simple and straightforward MPLS setup. So what I will do is I will create a static uh, link state path or LSP between PE1 and PE2. The first step in configuring is to assign a so-called link state routing identifier or LSR ID to all the MPLS devices. Like OSPF, the LSR ID is used to identify the MPLS device for various MPLS operations. So let me just configure this on all the devices. LSR ID 1111. Again, so we're going to use the loopback interface for this. MPLS LSR. So that's 2. And So that's the MPLS LSR IDs. And in addition, I will also enable MPLS on all the P and P interfaces that are connecting to each other. So that's the one. Finally, on PE2, now let's create a static LSP. There are a couple of things that you need to know for this. Have a look at this diagram. Setting up an LSP is done per hop, so this means that I have to create a static LSP between PE1 and P1. And I have to create a static LSP between P1 and PE2. In this setup, the P device will be a transit device for the LSP. Another thing is that an LSP is unidirectional, so it only operates in a single direction. 
This means that I have to set up an LSP from PE1 as ingress that goes via PE1 to PE2 as egress. And I have to create an LSP from PE2 as ingress that goes via P1 to PE1 as egress. Now let me guide you through the configuration. We'll start with PE1 creating an egress LSP going to P1, so the outgoing LSP. The LSP uses unique labels so that the receiving device is aware of which LSP the MPLS packet belongs to. Okay, so let's create this static LSP. So static LSP, and it has to be an ingress. I need to give it a name, and I have to set the destination network, which is 172.16.2.0 because I want to terminate there. Subnet mask 24, and next hop will be 10 10 10. .10 and my out label will be 100. Now you notice that I'm not using the loopback interface as next hop. This is because a static LSP requires the next hop to have operational MPLS. The loopback interface does not support that function, so in this situation we have to use the physical interfaces as next hop. In subsequent videos, I will show you the purpose of the loopback interfaces in MPLS. This is when we start working with BGP and LDP signaling. And that's when the loopback interfaces become relevant. Okay, so let's uh, do the transit. Uh, static LSP. And that's going to be a transit one. Give it a name. the in label which is 100 so this comes from PE1 I have to define the next hop which will be 10.10.10.14 .10 .10 that's the PE interface and my out label will be 101 and then on PE2 I have to configure an egress LSP so static LSP egress and give it a name 12p2 and my in label will be 101 coming from the p1 so we have to do exactly the same for the LSP from PE2 uh, to PE1 obviously uh, using different labels so on PE2 we create a static LSP which will be an ingress LSP, we name it PE2 to PE1 and to set the destination network to 172.16.100 subnet mask 24 and the next hop will be 10.10.10.13 uh, .10 and my out label will be 200 Okay, on the P device I create a static LSP in transit mode, PE2 to PE1. My in label is 200, so that's coming from PE2. My next hop will be 10.10.10.1, which is PE1, and my out label will be 201. And then finally on PE1, create a static LSP, which it will be an egress, uh, PE2 to PE1, and my in label will be 201. Now let's check whether the LSPs are up and running with the display MPLS static LSP command. So you can see they're up on PE1, they're also up on the P1 device, and they should also be up on PE2. Great. So this works. So let's see whether I can ping scene.1.1 .1 from the uh, CE interfaces 2.1. So that ping is working as well. 
Now you might think that these IP addresses and these IP networks are already known through the IGP protocol because they are added to the OSPF area so that pinging between the PE interfaces that are connected to the CEs are just using normal router. But this is not the case. So let me show you this in a network trace. So I'm running Wireshark here and I'm going to issue a ping again. So what I'm currently doing is I'm um, tracing the link between P1 and PE2. So let me issue a ping. So what you can see here now is you can see those pings. Let me just stop the trace and inspect one of the pings. So what you can see here is you can see in this ping that actually that ICMP packet is encapsulated in uh, in MPLS. So it's doing MPLS uh, switching here. And you can also see the MPLS label. So you can see MPLS label 200 here. And let me just take another one. And 101. So because this is the link between P1 and PE2, you can see that the uh, inbound packet w is using MPLS label 101 and the return packet is using MPLS label 200. So that proves that the uh, actually the uh, the ping or the, the communication between those uh, two IPs are using MPLS. So this concludes the, um, the introductory uh, MPLS demonstration video. So be on the lookout for more exciting videos covering MPLS because there's a lot to talk about if it comes to MPLS. If you have any comments or feedback please let us know and if you like the video you know where to find a like button. Thanks for watching.